Hello, everybody. I am Christiana Limniatis. I am the Director of Preservation Services for um, Preservation Buffalo Niagara. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sorry, I'm fiddling with my screen trying to get everything settled. Um, thank you again for joining us for tonight's program, Leslie Feinberg's Buffalo Historic Sites in Stone Butch Blues. Uh, before I turn it over to our speaker, we have some housekeeping things and some introductions to make. Um, first, obviously, this is a virtual webinar program, right? So only the people who are going to be able to unmute themselves are us, the presenters of this event. Um, but even though you as the attendees can't um, unmute yourself or turn your videos on, doesn't mean we don't want you to interact with this event. Um, uh, we definitely want you to be participatory in this event. And there are two ways that we would like you to do that. Uh, first is if you throughout the entire presentation at any moment have a question that you want me or any of the other people that you'll see on the screen speaking uh, as the evening goes on, if you have questions you want one of us to answer, then make sure to put that into the chat button. So if you're new to Zoom, if you just wiggle your mouse around, you'll see that Q&A button pop up and make sure to put your questions in there. But there is also the chat box and you can use the chat box if you have any comments or other types of uh, commentary that you'd like to add in, but that don't necessarily need to come to us, the speakers, to be addressed or answered during the question and answer program section that will be at the end of the event. Um, whether you are putting questions in the Q&A box or typing in the chat box, uh, please keep in mind that we are committed uh, to providing a friendly, uh, professional, and safe, welcoming environment for all participants in our virtual events. Um, inappropriate or unacceptable behavior will not be tolerated, so if you make a beautiful discriminatory or derogatory statements uh, in the Q&A or in the chat box, you do risk immediate removal from this program um, and possible restrictions on participating in future PBN events. PBN, again, Preservation Buffalo Niagara, we are your, if you're new to us, we are the region's only fully service, full service, professionally staffed historic preservation uh, organization empowering Western New York communities to champion historic preservation as a means of creating a more culturally rich, vibrant, affordable, and sustainable community. I specifically say region because while our name has Buffalo and Niagara in it, we actually provide services to the five westernmost counties of New York State. So whether you are here in Buffalo with us where our offices are or any of those five counties in Western New York, we are here to provide you assistance and your preservation adventure. Um, again, we are a non-profit you know, membership-based organization. While we may secure various grants to help with very specific projects, the vast majority of our day-to-day -day work advocating for the preservation of our historic built environment is made possible through membership dollars and donations. Our program tonight was free, but many of you took it onto yourself to make a donation when you registered, so thank you so very much. Again, it is through that type of support through our membership dollars that not only allow us to do our work, um, but when in regard to educational programming like tonight um, is the way that we are able to keep our programming free and low cost. So again, thank you so much to you who did make that donation tonight. Um, for those of you who are not already members, if you enjoy tonight's program, learn something, have a fun time, I definitely encourage you to head to our website to see other ways that you can support our organization. Um, through the evening, and already you can see in the chat box, uh, my coworker Tia is here with us, kind of man that chat box and stuff and so she will be sharing already some links in that chat box and throughout the program as well. Um, so we are your main hosts tonight, but we are co-hosting this program tonight, actually, with the Cornell University's Public History Initiative. And to introduce that organization, I will turn it over to Stephen Veter, the an assistant pro pro professor of history and the director of the Public History Initiative. Stephen. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, I just want to say that um, we are so delighted to be able to co-host this event. Um, my name is, is Stephen Beter, and I'm, as, as Christy mentioned, Assistant Professor and Director of the Public History Initiative at Cornell. Um, the Public History Initiative was started at Cornell in 2019 to stimulate and deepen dialogues with, with Cornell's students, faculty, staff, and their wider communities about the various sedimented histories that shape our contemporary world. And we think about that in a range of different formats and forms, including museums, monuments, and today historic preservation. Um, and we do that work in a range of ways, 
through courses, fellowships, public programs, and through our website, um, where you can um, um, find out more about our other upcoming events and other student work. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at CU Public History. Um, and again, I just wanna say how absolutely delighted we are to be able to co-sponsor this event tonight with PBN. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and so now it is time for some Stone Butch Blues amazingness. Our lecture tonight is pre presented by Dr. Jeff Yovanoni. Dr. Jeff Yovanoni is public historian and preservationist from Buffalo, New York, and a master's student uh, in historic preservation planning at Cornell University. He previously received his PhD in American Studies from the University at Buffalo in 2012 and coordinated the Women's and Gender Studies program at SUNY at Fredonia from 2013 to 2012. 20, 2021, excuse me. Um, his area of interest includes LGBTQ history, historic preservation, connections between preservation, public history and social justice, and the use of preservation planning to benefit historically marginalized communities. Yovanoni is also the co-founder of Gay Places, a joint project with us, Preservation Buffalo Niagara, that documents and celebrates LGBTQ historic sites in Western New York. So again, welcome Jeff up and have him share his screen for his presentation. And again, one last reminder, any questions that you have throughout the program that you want Jeff to answer, uh, uh, make sure to put into that Q&A box. And with that, Jeff, take it away. <laughs> Okay. All right. Is that good? Can we all see? Yes, it looks good. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, um, Christy, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I just want to start by uh, thanking a few people, uh, PBN especially, for uh, having me back again uh, to talk about uh, gay places and specifically um, Stone Butch Blues. Um, Jesse Fisher, the executive director, um, Christy, my partner in crime. And I just want to emphasize that uh, even though in terms of some of the Gay Places events that we've done, I'm usually the face and the person speaking, um, that it's very much a collaboration between Christy and myself. So I just want to make sure uh, she gets her due. Uh, and then also Tia Brown for creating the, the beautiful graphics for the events that um, reference the original Firebrand Books um, cover, which I absolutely love. Uh, I also want to uh, thank Dan DeLandro and Hope Dunbar from the Davis Archive at SUNY Buffalo State. Could not have um, done this project without the materials um, from that archive. Uh, also, Cynthia Van Ness, the reference librarian uh, from the Buffalo History Museum, uh, and then also Stephen Veter and the Public History Initiative um, at Cornell for co-sponsoring uh, and supporting this work. Okay, um, so I am going to jump right in. And start by talking about who Leslie Feinberg was and I really want to, to emphasize that um, you don't need to have read uh, Stone Butch Blues to be able to uh, understand um, this presentation. I've structured it so that if you've read the book, you haven't read the book, um, you're going to get something out of what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, and I have also created a reading guide that we're going to distribute um, at the end. So if you want to go back and right, look at some of the, the sites I'm going to talk about in the book, or if you haven't read the book uh, and, and this inspires you and you want to use the reading guide, um, we're going to make that available to you. Uh, so this is what uh, how Leslie Feinberg introduced herself uh, in the cover letter that she wrote to Nancy Berriano, the founder of Firebrand Books um, in Ithaca, when she submitted the manuscript for Stone Butch Blues. Uh, and I also just want to make a note about pronouns here. Um, Leslie identified as transgender and throughout her life um, used a variety of different pronouns. I tend to use she for her when I'm talking about her um, because all of the older LGBTQ people uh, I have interviewed and talked to from Buffalo that knew Leslie personally um, universally used uh, she, her. So I'm just gonna defer to 
that wisdom of my elders and the people that um, that that know Leslie. So just to know um, on that. So this is what she said in the cover letter. I grew up in Buffalo. As a working class Jewish lesbian, I came of age in and worked at the factories until they closed. Like the other butch women, Liz Kennedy's oral histories document, and we'll talk more about Liz Kennedy later, I had few options. We were unwelcome in the post Stonewall gay and lesbian movement and beaten, harassed and murdered on the streets. For some of us, the only alternative was to try and pass, and she means right, pass, um, pass as a man. My novel is the first to be written by a self-identified passing woman. And because of that, I think it will make room for other lesbians who are also struggling to understand and represent their own gender struggles. And these experiences offer rich insight for all women into the ways race, sex, and class impact on gender. And just to note on um, Leslie's use of uh, the term transgender, um, this is how she saw the term right, in reference to um, her own identity. So she said, I am transgendered. I was born female, but my masculine gender expression is seen as male. It's not my sex that defines me and it's not my gender expression. It's the fact that my gender expression appears to be at odds with my sex, right? So um, transgender, trans, right, literally means across. Um, she identified with this term uh, and helped um, to bring it to popularity um, because this disjunct, right, between her, her sex and her expression um, made her be seen as someone that was crossing uh, boundaries in terms of, of gender, right, which is why she, she strongly identified um, with this term. Okay, so this project and identifying um, sites in Stone Butch Blues. Um, and so I, I wanna talk just a little bit about um, how I came to, to work on this um, and also how I went uh, about identifying what are some of the actual sites in Buffalo that are represented in the book. Um, I encountered Stone Butch Blues for the first time when I was an undergraduate. And I remember seeing the book at Talking Leaves Books in Buffalo uh, when they were at their, their Main Street location, which no longer exists. Um, and I knew nothing about the book, nothing about Leslie Feinberg. Um, I saw it on the shelf and something about it just spoke to me. Um, I found the title really provocative. Uh, I was intrigued by you know, who is this very striking gender nonconforming person um, on the cover. Uh, and so I ended up buying it, read it, and it completely blew my mind at the time because I, I didn't realize at the time, you know, I was like 19, 20, um, at the time uh, that th there was any gay history in, in Buffalo, right? And that this book would kind of delve uh, into that um, so much. Um, but at the time, uh, I didn't know what to do with that. Also, the, the vision of gender that's presented in the novel um, was kind of more expansive um, than my understanding at the time. So I kind of you know put a pin in the book. Uh, and then later, when I was at SUNY at Fredonia, I started teaching the book. And I was also researching LGBTQ history in Western New York. Uh, and then I started to see, um, oh, I know what that event is. I know who that, that person is. I started to see a deeper layer um, uh, of the novel. And then when Christy and I started working on gay places and we were identifying sites related to LGBTQ history in Buffalo, uh, I went back to the book and started reading it as a preservationist and um, looking at the book uh, in terms of can we use this novel as a way to identify right, some sites in Buffalo related to 
um, LGBTQ history. And so, you know, somewhat of an unconventional approach, but I think if you know, we're doing um, queer preservation, we sometimes have to look for sites related to this history in unconventional uh, places. And what I realized when I started looking at the book through the lens of preservation, that one way that we could read this novel um, is it's actually um, a queer map of Buffalo's history in the 1960s and 70s, right? And, and whether Leslie Feinberg intended that or not, um, that's one way that we can read this book. Uh, and I was um, surprised by the number of sites uh, I was actually able to identify that are represented in the book based on the information given uh, in the novel and correlating that to other sources. And I'm only gonna talk about a selection of the sites that uh, I think are the most interesting um, in the presentation. So how did I, I go about identifying the sites? Essentially what I did is, is took the details um, that are in the novel and correlated them against other sources. So I, I looked at um, newspaper articles um, from the time, um, maps and atlases, um, photographs of the sites, um, city directories, uh, did oral histories with LGBTQ elders, right, who were around at that time or who had known Leslie personally. Uh, I think at this point I've done over 50 uh, and I have more lined up. Um, I used materials from the Madeline Davis LGBTQ archive of Western New York. Uh, I also looked at the, the Firebrand books records at, at Cornell to get a, better, be, get a better understanding of the publication history um, of the book. I interviewed Nancy Berriano, um, the, the founder of Firebrand. Um, I used materials from the Buffalo History Museum uh, and then also um, walked around and actually, uh, you know, visited um, some of the, the sites and locations. And right, just a couple of weeks ago when I was um, back in Buffalo, Christy and I were walking around and we were looking at uh, some of the sites from the book to get a, a better feel um, for things. So uh, you'll see in some of the photographs of, of the sites that I'll show, um, either Christy or myself um, took a lot of these. So that's how I went about identifying the sites. For all of them, um, can I say with you know 100% certainty that this is the exact bar or this is the exact um, factory that Leslie Feinberg was referencing or that she went to or that she worked in? Um, no, but can I make an evidence-based um, argument for um, all of the correlations I'm drawing? Um, yes. Uh, and can I make a case uh, for why I think, it, you know, uh, here's the real site that Leslie was at least partly inspired by? Um, yes. So, with that, I'm going to jump right in and talk about uh, a selection of sites from the novel. Uh, no, actually, before I do that, uh, I wanted to say a note about butch femme um, lesbian relationships, because this is something that um, comes up uh, and is very central in the novel. Um, so the Buffalo lesbian community, um, really the 1930s um, through um, the late 1960s is structured around butch femme roles, right? Where you had one partner who is the more masculine partner um, who was butch and then a partner who is more feminine uh, in terms of her expression and was considered the femme. Uh, and we have a very uh, handsome picture of a butch femme um, couple from um, Buffalo. This photograph is from uh, the Davis archive. Um, and so from our contemporary vantage point, um, I think it would be easy for us to say Oh, well, lesbians at the time structured their relationships around these roles because um, they didn't know right what, how to have a relationship between two women. So they were just replicating um, heterosexuality. Uh, and that actually was not um, the case. Uh, and one of the things that Liz Kennedy and Madeline Davis say in their oral history of the Buffalo lesbian community, or one of the things that they argue, um, is that 
these roles were actually a form of um, community organization and resistance, that that was their primary function, not a replication of heterosexuality. Because um, we have to remember, you know, at the time, um, there's not a rainbow flag outside the gay bar or um, places where, where gay people are, are congregating. So if you're a lesbian in Buffalo during this time, how are you going to find other lesbians? Well, it was the presence of the butch in these spaces um, who, through her masculine gender nonconformity, was visibly queer. And then for the femmes as well, right? How did they resist um, just being seen as heterosexual women because of their presentation? Well, if they were with their butch, that also marked them uh, as being visibly gay. And then there's also uh, in the community at the time, a subcategory of the butch role um, called the stone butch, right? And, and this is um, the title of the book and how um, the protagonist, Jess Goldberg, um, identifies. So a, a stone butch was a butch who preferred to give pleasure to her femme, um, but not receive pleasure in return. Right? That her pleasure was um, derived from right, pleasuring um, her, her partner. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify um, that terminology right, because it, uh, it forms part of the title of the novel. Okay. So our first site um, is the Feinberg family house. And recognizing that, that Stonebridge Blues right, is uh, a semi-autobiographical novel and that there's many correlations that we can draw uh, between the main character, Jess Goldberg and Leslie Feinberg's own life, um, this would have been the house um, that the Jess Goldberg character uh, is living in um, when she is a teenager and she decides that she's going to leave home um, and, and live on her own. And so this is where the Feinbergs were living, 510 Tacoma Avenue, which is uh, in North Buffalo. And um, this particular site uh, is one of the examples where the style of the house actually tells us something important um, about the Feinberg family. Um, so um, the Feinberg family house um, is a classic example of what was called a Buffalo double. Um, or it was essentially a two flat residence uh, standard type of housing uh, that was used by middle class workers um, in, in Buffalo. Uh, and so the Feinbergs um, purchased 510 Tacoma uh, in 1962. Uh, and their acquisition of the property uh, is represent representative of the larger uh, upward mobility of Jewish Buffalonians. Um, the first place that the family actually um, lives is uh, in the Bell Aircraft Corporation um, projects uh, in Niagara Falls. So essentially it was some um, housing that was built for the workers uh, in that factory where Irving Feinberg, Leslie's father is, is working. Uh, and then they're eventually able to purchase um, this two flat home. Uh, and essentially the idea was in terms of their, their upward mobility, um, they lived in one flat uh, and then they rented, uh, and they lived downstairs, they rented the upstairs, right, to help um, pay down their mortgage. Uh, and well, Leslie and her siblings are living here, they're attending Bennett High School in Buffalo and Bennett High School is specifically um, named in the book. Uh, so it's, it's interesting because some of the, the sites, she'll actually use um, the, the actual name. So she calls the high school Bennett. Um, other sites, she gives uh, a different name. And looking at, at, at this particular site was really um, illuminating uh, because it led me to more information um, about the Feinberg family. And um, Leslie's mother is quite an interesting 
um, character. And we see in the novel uh, um, that the Jess Goldberg character has conflict with her parents. They don't understand um, her gender nonconformity. They don't understand the fact that, that she wants to be masculine. Uh, and so Leslie's mother, um, Vance Hyde or, or um, Vance Feinberg, um, was the winner of the Mrs. Buffalo pageant in 1958. It was essentially a beauty pageant um, for homemakers. We see here on, on the left um, being crowned. And she was also a published um, author. She wrote two books um, that were about motherhood and parenting daughters. Um, and I find Vance Feinberg to be a really fascinating figure uh, because on the one hand, um, well, she's presenting herself as this typical wife and mother, um, she was also doing things that, um, that the typical wife and mother would not have been doing, like um, writing books and getting featured in, in the paper and and doing speaking events. Um, and so so it, it, it's interesting, right, then the conflict that the, the mother and the daughter have um, it, in the novel, right? Uh, it, if we correlate it then to the, to the, actual, uh, the, to the actual Feinberg um, family. Okay, and so um, I'm gonna move on and talk about a selection of bars from, um, from the book. Uh, and so if, when you look at the reading guide, I can make an argument in the reading guide about um, which real bar I think is the, the fictionalized bar um, in the novel, but I'm gonna talk about several bars that I think um, Leslie was drawing from in terms of her inspiration for the bars um, in the book, uh, and that I, I know um, that she actually went to these places from, uh, from talking to community members that, that knew her, or right, the bars that existed during the specific time period that, that she's writing about um, in, in the book. Uh, and the first was the Tiki restaurant, um, which was located on 330 Franklin Street. Uh, it's no longer extant. Uh, so it's a, a federal style building. And this photograph is not, is not from um, when the Tiki was in operation. We could see it says Tutton Battery Service. Um, but the um, part of the building where the awning is what was the entrance to the Tiki restaurant. Uh, and the Tiki was opened um, by a guy named Jim Garrow, uh, who's an important uh, figure in Buffalo Gay history, but is somewhat um, elusive because he wasn't here for that long. But he was originally um, born in Canada and then lived in Tampa, Florida for a while. Uh, and, and then is a restaurant owner. Uh, in Buffalo, and what he really wants to do is create a space for the gay community uh, and open a gay bar or have something like uh, a gay community center, but he's unable to get a liquor license. Um, so the, the Tiki was more of a, a restaurant and cafe um, than it actually was a functioning bar, but it becomes um, an important place for the community uh, in the late 1960s. And so we can see here, um, if we look at the building on uh, the Sanborn map from 1925. Um, so now the Sanborn maps um, are fire insurance maps um, that were not specifically made for historic preservation purposes, but are useful for preservationists um, for tracking changes in the built environment um, over time. This was useful looking at the Sanborn map um, because if we see 330 Franklin and then um, 332, uh, we could see it's labeled as a restaurant and that there's a space between, uh, or there's a doorway between the two buildings. Uh, and so this correlated, uh, so the footprint of the building on the Sanborn map correlated to what um, community members that I interviewed were telling me um, about um, the Tiki. And I was able to interview um, a woman named um, Myrnie Kern, Myrnie being short for Marilyn, uh, and she was actually Leslie Feinberg's um, girlfriend. 
during uh, during this time and part of the time she's writing about in Stone Butch Blues. And Myrna is not um, represented as a character in, in the book, but there's pieces of her um, in several of the characters that appear in the novel. Um, and this is what she told me about um, the, the tiki. And, and when I'm talking about historic sites, I always like to uh, include right, actual um, queer people from Buffalo, include their voices uh, in connection to the stories that, that we can tell about the buildings. Um, and she was quite a character. I think this is the only um, interview I've ever done with someone where, um, the person had an outline that, that she prepared of things that, that she wanted to talk to me about um, in advance. So this is what she says about the Tiki Club. We had a period of time where there were no bars. That is when all of a sudden the Tiki Club showed up. And I don't remember how I heard about it, but you know, we had quite a network or whatever. So the Tiki was on Franklin and Tupper. It had two rooms and both had tables. Jim Garrow would, it was just a coffee house. There was no booze. Make a turkey every day. So he started getting a lunch bunch every day from downtown. He would either have a hot roast with bread and gravy or cold turkey sandwiches. And he would serve that until he ran out of turkey and that was it. So there was many a night I went down there for dinner at around five, six o'clock and had turkey and that was it. He only made turkey. That was the only thing on his menu and he made damn good coffee. And once in a while, he would have a folk singer come in. We weren't real happy about it. There were straight people who would come in for that. If you didn't have a folk singer, it would be a Friday or Saturday night with a jukebox and we would be dancing all the time. I'm pretty sure that place was open like 24 hours a day. As a matter of fact, I remember drinking coffee there all night and then going to work. I got to work and I remember telling everybody that I hadn't slept all night, you know, and it was like, wow, if you drink enough coffee, you never have to waste time sleeping. You can stay out all night and party as long as you get enough coffee. Yeah, try that two nights in a row and you start falling asleep at work standing up. It was not a good idea. So one of the, um, the other things that, um, people would do, gay people would do that were going to the tiki, right, because they didn't have a liquor license, is there was another um, restaurant and bar that was right next to the tiki on Franklin Street um, called Benji's Lounge and Restaurant. Um, so if we're looking at the photograph here um, from right to left, the building that's right in front of where the car is, that's 334 Franklin, where Benji's was. Uh, and then we see the intersection of Franklin and West Tupper and the building um, that says the radio doctor is the building that um, the Tiki was in. So what people would do is they wanted to hang out at the Tiki because that was the gay spot, but they couldn't get alcohol there. So they would go to Benji's and get drunk and then go back to the Tiki. And it was almost like um, they had a gay bar essentially. Uh, and then if we also look here at 334 um, Franklin uh, on the Sanborn map, right, we can see that it's designated as, uh, as a restaurant. Uh, and um, 334 Franklin, just like 330 and, and 332 um, are no longer extant. So the, the buildings are, are no longer there. And so here is the um, the lovely parking lot where um, where the building that housed 330 Franklin uh, Franklin Street once stood. And then another um, bar that people were going to uh, at the time, and um, this bar is Ninfa's is directly represented in um, Stone Butch Blues. It's the first bar that Jess Goldberg goes to. And in the novel, um, it's called Tifka's. This was a bar on um, restaurant and bar on Main Street in Niagara Falls, which at the time was kind of like the tenderloin 
um, district of, of Niagara Falls where um, all the most happening clubs were. Uh, it's the bar is referred to as being in the Tenderloin district um, in the novel. And at the time people actually called um, Main Street and Niagara Falls the Tijuana um, of Canada. Uh, and so Ninfa's bar and restaurant um, was owned by Italian American proprietress um, Ninfo Duraco. Uh, she owned this bar for 60 years um, from 1909 um, until her death in 1969. Uh, and at some point in the 1950s, 1951, um, she actually turns over uh, management of the bar to Anthony J. Infantino. She's, uh, she still owns the bar, but she turns over, uh, over the management. And one of the things that I need to investigate further with this particular bar is we can see in the ad um, that the ad says it was located at 324 Main Street. Uh, and then we have other articles saying it was located at 342 Main Street. And I think maybe 324 is, uh, is a typo because again, if we look at the Sanborn map, um, we could see that 340 and 342 were actually designated as a restaurant. Uh, and if we look at 324, I didn't include it on here, um, but it was designated as auto parking. So I think the correct address um, was um, 342. I need to do a little bit more investigation. So I think the restaurant was 342 uh, and Nympha Duraco and her family lived at, at, at 340. Um, but this is the inspiration for the Tifka's bar in Stone Butch Blues. And again, um, hearing from Mernie Kern, this is what she had to say about nymphas. There is a gay bar in Niagara Falls called Nymphas, like nymphomaniacs. It might've been a straight bar during the day, but at night it was gay. And they used to have the Miss Buffalo contest. So yeah, Ninfa's was there when we needed a gay bar because Benji's didn't really cut it and more people had come over to Benji's. They would go to the Tiki for a while and then come over to Benji's and all of a sudden, lots of lesbians in Buffalo were barflies. So they started turning Benji's into a gay bar. Anyway, some of us would go up to Niagara Falls. We would either take a bus or ride with somebody. Ninfas every year had the Miss Buffalo contest. Why they called it Miss Buffalo when they were in Niagara Falls, I don't know. They had drag queens that came from Erie, Rochester, Buffalo to compete for Miss Buffalo. And it was an all evening thing. It started early and it went late. And they had singing, of course. Uh, they were just lip singing and they had the bathing suit competition. Um, and so if you've um, read Stonebridge Blues, um, the parts of the novel that are about Tifka's, uh, Jess Goldberg um, meets a drag queen there named Mona who helps her during a police raid. Uh, and it's also the place where she meets her mentor, Butch Al and her femme Jacqueline. And Butch Al is um, the person who teaches her, uh, right, how to be uh, a, a butch, how to survive uh, right in, um, in the gay world and in Western New York at this time. Another um, bar that serves as the, the inspiration for one of the bars in the novel was the, the Little Harlem Hotel. And in particular, one of Jess Goldberg's friends is named Edwin, um, who is a black butch. And there's a scene in the novel um, where Edwin takes Jess to uh, a club on the west side. Um, so this would have been um, mid to late 1960s. And I think um, Leslie Feinberg is certainly drawing from uh, the Little Harlem Hotel as the inspiration for that club. Um, so Little Harlem was located at 496 Michigan Avenue. Um, it's part of where the, the, um, the hotel was. It's part of the Michigan Street African-American Heritage Corridor. Uh, and it was owned and operated by African-American businesswoman, um, Aunt Montgomery. The Little Harlem opened in 1934 and it was a popular um, jazz club on Buffalo's East Side. And it hosted performances by people like Cab Calloway, um, Della Reese, Sarah Vaughn, 
Uh, and so I think this is certainly that that inspiration that Leslie is drawing from. Uh, and one of the things that we know from Kennedy and Davis's work um, was that queer and gender nonconforming people um, were given um, or allowed some space at the Little Harlem Hotel, right? And we, we see um, this being represented in the novel. Um, although I think we shouldn't um, overstate that. And so it wasn't like, um, Black and queer Buffalonians had some sort of um, formal coalition, um, but more so that there was an understanding of a shared outsiderhood. Uh, so queer people, to an extent, um, were, were allowed uh, at, at the, the Little Harlem Hotel. Um, unfortunately, the building was destroyed by a fire uh, in 1993, uh, and we now have a historical plaque um, that designates the spot where the Little Harlem once stood. Okay, and then I think this is my final um, bar. I'm gonna uh, talk about the Tiki Two or the Madison Club. Um, and so before we look at a photograph, let's first look at um, the Sanborn map. So this is Delaware Avenue uh, and we can see um, 70 Delaware, or actually let me start at the, the, the top of the map, my, my apologies. Okay, so we can see Townsend Hall, um, which was a building that was owned by the University of Buffalo. And then we see this alleyway that no longer exists that was called the Guthrie Alley. And we see 70 Delaware. Now, 70 Delaware is no longer extant. It was demolished to make room for um, the current Frank A. Sedita um, courthouse. But it was useful looking at the Sanborn map for 70 Delaware, because one of the things that community members told me was that there was a front room of the building that served as a, a restaurant bar. And then there was a back room um, where people would meet um, when we start having a, a formal gay and lesbian rights movement uh, in Buffalo. Right? This, was, this was the meeting place. And so if we look at the footprint of the building on the Sanborn, we can clearly see the front of the building uh, is clearly labeled as restaurant. And then we have this back room. One of the other things that um, people told me was that it was a three-story building. And we can also confirm by looking at the Sanborn map that 70 Delaware had um, three stories. So the details that people were telling me in the oral histories I was doing matched up to the, to the footprint of the building um, on the map. Uh, and so here is, um, this photograph is a bit underwhelming. Um, the, the best photograph that I could find that, that exists of um, 70 Delaware. So in the foreground, we see Townsend Hall, and then we see a building behind it. And then we see a space between the two buildings that was the Guthrie Alley. And then behind that, um, we see 70 Delaware. Uh, it was a dilapidated building at the time. So unfortunately, um, I think because it wasn't um, particularly attractive or architecturally stunning, um, that there just aren't a lot of photographs um, of it. So if you have a picture of, if anyone has a, has a photograph of 70 Delaware, um, hook us up, but, um, and, and I tried, you know, looking at photographs of other buildings surrounding um, 70 Delaware um, to see if it might be in some of those photographs, but I think that this is uh, as good as we're gonna get this, this in the Sandbar map um, to have an actual representation um, of the building. But this is um, the building where the gay rights movement in Buffalo um, really begins. And it was the site of a particularly intense bar raid that's represented um, in Stone Butch Blues. Um, so um, the novel talks about um, a, a bar raid that happens after Stonewall or after the birth of gay pride, um, which is how it's described um, in the novel. Uh, and I think that Feinberg was referencing uh, a raid that happened at 70 Delaware. 
And one of the things that we also see, um, this is a zoomed out version of the Sanborn map that shows us all of Niagara Square. Um, having something like a gay bar at 70 Delaware at this time in the late 1960s, early 1970s was an incredibly risky venture uh, because we can see, so we can see Delaware Avenue in the middle of the map. Um, to the left is City Hall and then further down the street on uh, Delaware was the County Holding Center. Uh, so this is right, right near City Hall, right near the Holding Center. Uh, and during this raid that occurred on the bar, um, the police didn't even need police cars or a paddy wagon. They actually just marched people right down the street um, to, to the Holding Center. So I mentioned Jim Garrow and the Tiki before. And he has quite uh, an ingenious idea uh, in terms of being able to start uh, something like a gay bar in Buffalo uh, at the time uh, when the bars were really being aggressively targeted um, by the Buffalo Police Department um, Bureau of Vice Enforcement. So he buys this building at 70 Delaware and his idea is, um, well, this building is my private residents. So I'm just going to open it up for all of my gay friends and we can have a party, right? And so that, that's a way that um, we can have a gay bar. I'm just going to have people over to this building that I own. Um, of course, the police catch wind of that. Um, they survey the bar they send someone in undercover. And the thing that really does um, Jim Garrow in is the fact that he was um, charging people a cover charge to, to enter um, the building. And then so then they hit him with a whole host of other charges um, that he's selling alcohol without a liquor license. He has a, a jukebox without a license. He has a pool table without a license. Uh, and there is a particularly um, brutal raid um, on, on the bar. Uh, and at this time, um, he wanted to call it the Tiki also. So some people in the community called it um, the Tiki too, but he could never get a restaurant um, or a liquor license. Uh, and so, he ends up calling um, the building the Mattachine Club because this is where the Mattachine Society of the Niagara Frontier, Buffalo's first gay and lesbian civil rights organization, um, starts meeting. Uh, and so there's this raid on the Mattachine Club. Uh, and if we look at the newspaper coverage, um, the details correlate to how the raid is described in Stonebush Blues, um, namely that it was the women um, that were in the bar that were particularly fighting back against the police. And if you've read Stonewitch Blues, you know that the police officer um, that's the villain um, in the novel uh, is named Lieutenant Mulroney. Now, I think the fact that Feinberg gives Mulroney an Irish name is not a coincidence um, because the captain of the Bureau of Vice Enforcement at the time um, was named Kenneth P. Kennedy, and he had a reputation for uh, being incredibly homophobic and being uh, a devout Irish Catholic. Uh, and, and he saw it as uh, it was his ethical and moral responsibility to target things in the city like homosexuality and prostitution. Uh, and Lieutenant John J. Breen um, was the lieutenant that actually carried out the raid at the instruction um, of Kenneth P. Kennedy. And um, Breen is here on the left. Kenneth Kennedy is on the right. They're inspecting a, a liquor still uh, in, in this photograph. Um, so I think it's not a coincidence um, that Kennedy had this reputation of being a devout Irish Catholic and that Leslie Feinberg gives her police officer that's um, the villain in Stonebush Blues an Irish name. So I'm, I would make the argument that um, Mulroney is, is Kenneth P. Kennedy. One of the other things um, I want to emphasize as well um, that 
Feinberg makes a point of in Stonebush Blues um, when she's talking about this particular bar raid uh, is that the characters in the novel um, are not particularly being influenced um, by the Stonewall riots in New York City. They're more so responding to conditions in, uh, in Buffalo. And this mirrors um, the, the reality um, of the community when they were, they were organizing and forming the first um, gay rights organization in uh, the, the late 1960s. And this point was um, echoed to me over and over again um, with people that I interviewed. Uh, I think Madeline Davis uh, in her autobiography, um, Femme Finale, explains this the best. And she said, although Stonewall made front page downstate news, in Buffalo, it was hardly a blip on the radar screen. Buffalo, unlike New York City, is a large middle American small town. A gay riot 450 miles away was of note to a few, but didn't engender political exuberance. For most of us, what was happening in New York City was happening in another world. And this, um, this riot, or excuse me, this raid that's represented in Stonebush Blues, right, that's based on the actual raid of 70 Delaware, uh, inspires the first um, public demonstration for gay rights um, in Buffalo, which was a picket of City Hall. Uh, and this had you know, largely been, been lost to community memory um, until I was going through um, editions of the Buffalo Courier Express on microfilm uh, in the E.H. Butler Library at SUNY Buffalo State, and I came across this tiny little article um, from the Courier Express. Um, Pickets ask rights for homosexuals. Um, seven young men picketed in front of City Hall briefly Monday afternoon, holding signs that read civil rights for homosexuals and end police harassment. Several persons were arrested Saturday in a police raid on a downtown club um, said to have been frequented by homosexuals, i.e. Um, 70 Delaware. Uh, and the fact that right, they were picketing in front of City Hall, which is pictured here uh, in Niagara Square on a Monday afternoon, um, when Niagara Square would have been incredibly busy, um, there would have been a lot of traffic, uh, exposing themselves publicly um, was an incredibly um, gutsy thing to do at the time. Uh, I'll, and I should note here that this article is slightly incorrect. Um, it wasn't seven young men, uh, it was six young men and one woman. Uh, and in fact, Mernie Kern, uh, Leslie's girlfriend at the time, who I mentioned uh, previously, was actually one of the picketers, um, but her appearance was more butch. She had short hair. Uh, and so the reporter from the Career Express just assumed um, that she was a guy, but it was actually uh, six young men and, and one woman. Okay, so I think that that's it for the, the bars. Uh, and then one of the other things that we see in the novel is there is an incredible amount of factories um, that are represented in the book, which really give us uh, an idea of where working class lesbians in Buffalo uh, were working during the 1960s uh, and 1970s. Uh, and one of the the places that's represented um, in the book um, was the Bethlehem Steel Corporation. Um, here is a, a map of the, the plant, the Lackawanna plant on Route 5 um, from the Library of Congress. And when um, Feinberg talks about Bethlehem Steel in the novel, she makes reference to a particular Supreme Court case, United States versus Bethlehem Steel Corporation in 1970, where the federal government actually sued Bethlehem Steel um, because of their exclusionary hiring practices, that they weren't hiring enough African Americans uh, and women. Uh, and Feinberg makes direct reference to this case. Justice friend Grant um, calls her 
and says, you know, hey, the steel plant has to hire um, these women, let's go down and get a job. Uh, and I'll quote directly from the novel. When I called Grant, she had big news. The steel plant has to hire 50 women, she told me. They're accepting applications Wednesday morning. I don't know about you, but I'll be camping out on the line Tuesday night. By late that night, the line will stretch from Lackawanna to Tonawanda. Um, so Feinberg doesn't specifically named Bethlehem Steel, but she's definitely talking about Bethlehem, right, and making uh, reference to this court case where suddenly um, the, Bethlehem has to hire um, more women. Uh, so this is the, the map of the plant. Um, this is a photograph of uh, the administration building um, that was located on the compound of the plant uh, and it's a, in a Beaux-Arts style. And then here's a photograph of a woman worker at Bethlehem Steel um, from around this time period where Feinberg's talking about it um, in the novel. So this is from um, 1969. And there's so many other uh, factories referenced um, in, in the book um, where we can get an idea right of where queer women were working. Uh, so the, the Freezer Queen warehouse, uh, which is a frozen food uh, plant, the Buffalo Milk Company building, um, the Joya Macaroni um, factory located on, on Elmwood Avenue. Uh, and I'm, I'm still investigating uh, and seeing if I can identify um, some of the other factories that are, are represented um, in the book. And, and some of them I just might not be able to, right? Because one, so one of the things that we know is that um, Jess Goldberg and also Leslie Feinberg herself worked at a book bindery in the 1960s. And then uh, when I went to the city directories and was looking for book bindaries, uh, it's like, you know, who knew there was 20 plus book bindaries in Buffalo in, in the 1960s, right? So some of um, the sites, there might not be enough information in the novel with the factories in particular to be able to name um, the specific factory, but you'll see on um, the reading guide that I was able to find quite a few of them. Then there's also a few um, sites in the novel um, that are connected to um, the, the university and changes at um, the University at Buffalo and how that's impacting the way um, that people think about um, gender and sexuality. Uh, and Jess's girlfriend, um, Teresa, uh, is working at the University of Buffalo um, in the novel and she um, gets made fun of by younger, more radical women um, from the university who are involved in women's studies for being um, a femme. Right? So make specific reference to um, women's studies at the University at Buffalo um, at this time. And um, the Women's Studies College um, was actually um, housed in this house um, that was located on Winspear Avenue, um, which abuts the university's um, South Campus. This was the center um, of women's studies um, at the University at Buffalo from the mid 1970s to the early 1980s. And the reason why um, the program was in this house uh, is because in the late 1960s, this is when the University of Buffalo um, becomes part of the SUNY system. Uh, and the university creates um, this system that was called the collegiate system as a way to channel uh, student engagement um, into social and political issues. Uh, and the university created this series of colleges, um, which were essentially um, thematic student-led learning communities that were organized around a partic particular topic or theme um, that were not uh, degree granting, but it was a way to kind of bring cohesion to the student body by engaging students around um, a common interest. And Women's Studies College uh, was founded in 1971 by the trailblazing lesbian cultural anthropologist, uh, Elizabeth Lepofsky Kennedy, who I've referenced earlier. Uh, and the university was expanding so quickly, right? There were so many kind of new students and faculty and programs that they didn't have space for the colleges on 
um, on the, the physical campus itself. So what the university essentially did is they bought um, houses that were near the campus. And this was the, the space for um, some of the programs um, in the university. I mean, so while the, the, the university was expanding, Women's Studies College was, was located um, at this particular or in this particular um, house. And um, this is useful to, to think about in terms of its representation in the novel, because we, we see uh, how with the emergence of the gay liberation movement, the lesbian feminist movement in the 1970s, um, that there's conflicting ideas about gender and sexuality. And some of, of uh, these younger, more radical women uh, who are going to school in Buffalo, but were not from Buffalo or not from um, working class backgrounds, um, look down on or don't understand um, some of the, the older women who were into the butch femme roles. Uh, and this acts as a real source of alienation for um, Jess Goldberg in, in the novel and kind of her struggle um, with self and influences right her decision to pass as a, a man, um, both because she feels like she doesn't fit into the gay community uh, at the time as a butch woman, uh, and also uh, Buffalo is deindustrializing uh, at the um, at this time, there's less jobs for women in the factories, right? And she feels like she'll have a better chance at that um, if, if she passes as, as a man, right? And, and people read her as being male. And she also references uh, you know, particular you know, radical um, lesbian organization in, in, in Buffalo that's looking um, down on some of the women that are uh, into the butch femme roles. Uh, and I think the, the real organization that Feinberg is referencing um, was the organization um, Buffalo Radical Lesbians, um, taking inspiration from um, the organization Radical Lesbians in, in New York City. And here we see um, a woman uh, from Buffalo uh, at the 1971 March on Albany for, for gay rights, um, carrying her, her buff Buffalo Radical Lesbians um, sign. So this is the, the real lesbian organization uh, that's referenced by Feinberg in the novel. Okay, and then if you've, you've read the novel, um, you know that the, the first section of it takes place in Buffalo and then Jess Goldberg goes to New York City and then at the end of the novel um, comes back to Buffalo to make peace um, with her past, to connect with some of um, the women that she knew uh, when she was coming of age. Uh, and they go to uh, a lesbian bar and the character tells us uh, at the time that she's around 40 years old. So if we take um, Jess as being the same age as Leslie, that puts us at 1989, 1990. Uh, so based on that date, um, I think the, the bar that Feinberg is referencing here uh, is MC Compton's, which is located at 1239 Niagara Street. Um, and so MC Compton's um, was actually, or this building was actually home to um, two gay bars, uh, a, a bar that existed in the late 60s that was called the TNT Western Paradise um, that I also think that Feinberg is drawing inspiration from because uh, I know she was, she was going there. People told me that she was going there. Uh, and then um, later Compton's, which is opened in 1981 uh, and exists in the building till, uh, till 2001. And an interesting fact about MC Compton's uh, is in 1992, um, the bar hosted a drag king show that was a benefit for Active Western New York um, that was called Passing Fancy. Uh, and at this drag king show, um, Leslie Feinberg gave a presentation about passing women in history. Uh, so some of the research that would uh, inform her second book, Transgender Warriors. And then she emceed a drag king performance that um, 
uh, was was all um, Buffalo lesbians performing it as drag kings. Um, so we know that Leslie was familiar um, with MC Compton's, uh, and I think this is the inspiration for um, the the bar that Jess Goldberg goes to when she has her her homecoming and she comes back to back to Buffalo. And so we could see um, here just some of the, the building's um, evolution, um, this ad for the, the TNT uh, Western Paradise, um, which is open from the uh, mid 50s to the late 1960s, and then uh, an advertisement for MC Compton's um, from the Fifth Freedom, which is Buffalo's gay newspaper, um, celebrating the bar's um, opening in 1981. So we can kind of get an idea. Oh yeah, and I should have mentioned that um, uh, now the building is a gourmet popcorn store, right? So we can kind of see um, between the empty MC Compton's photograph uh, and uh, the current photograph, a, a bit how the building has changed over time. Okay. And one of the things that helped me uh, identify that the, the, the bar that Feinberg was talking about here was um, Compton's is she describes it as um, a bar that's on a lesbian bar that's on the outskirts of Buffalo. And if we look at the, the gay bars that existed at um, the time, really the only one um, that's on the outskirts and matches her description um, was Compton's. This um, section of Niagara Street is not, not residential. It's primarily um, con commercial and industrial buildings. We see a lot of industrial buildings um, like the one here that's located on the corner of um, Niagara Street and Auburn um, Avenue. Um, so the bar essentially was on, on the outskirts um, of the city because it wasn't located uh, in a primarily residential area, right? So the, the, the actual actual um, area that the bar is located in uh, matches the description um, of the bar from the novel. And then you know, at the conclusion of um, the book, when Jess Goldberg comes back to Buffalo, uh, one of the things that she wants to do is she wants to, to find her, her mentor, Butch Al again and talk to her and uh, make peace with her past. And one of the things that she learns is that um, that Butch Al is um, in. It's described in the book as being uh, is that she's in in the asylum um, on Elmwood Avenue, uh, and so Jess goes to visit Butch Al. And I'm just gonna read the description from the novel. So she's pulling up to the asylum um, on her motorcycle. Uh, so I, I felt connected to the triumph as I turned sharply into the curves of the expressway. An old power flowed through me. That exhilaration drained the moment I cut the engine in the parking lot of the asylum. I took off my helmet and looked up at the medieval building. Every window was latticed with iron bars. A cold shiver ran through me, but I wanted to see Al more than I wanted to run away. So uh, Leslie Feinberg was clearly um, referencing um, the quote unquote um, Buffalo Asylum for the Insane. And I say quote unquote, um, because that's um, how the, the building is um, described um, in terms of uh, it being landmarked, um, but that we wouldn't necessarily use that um, that language um, to uh, to um, talk about mental health um, today. But this is certainly what what Feinberg what was um, referencing, uh, and this is a photograph of uh, the administration um, building um, of the asylum, which is located in the Richardson Olmsted um, complex on Forest Avenue. Uh, and uh, so the complex is designated, uh, was designated a National Historic Landmark um, in 1986. 
Uh, and the site was designed by um, the noted American architect, Henry Hobson Richardson, uh, and the landscape um, was done by la noted um, landscape architects, Frederick Law Olmsted um, and Calvert Vaux in the late 1800s. Right? And the idea, uh, or the, the canvas kind of represented um, new ideas um, in terms of treating people with mental illness, um, that they needed kind of air and, and space and to be outdoors. And so the, the campus um, sought to reflect those ideas. Um, and the style of this building uh, is um, a kind of uh, Romanesque revival um, called Richardsonian Romanesque that's particularly associated with Henry Hobson um, Richardson. And he actually pioneers that uh, that particular kind of Romanesque revival style um, on, on, on the asylum. Uh, and so Jess goes to see her mentor, um, Butch L. Uh, and Butch L has, it, it is not particularly conscious, has kind of retreated from the world uh, in terms of the trauma that she's experienced, but then she has this moment of lucidity and she recognizes Jess and um, Jess gets to thank her mentor for everything that she's imparted to her and that she's helped her to uh, survive. And that then she can take that information uh, and pass it on to the next generation, right? And, and what is that, that information? Um, that's Stonebridge Blues. That's this book. That's everything that um, we've been discussing. It's the, the wisdom that uh, Leslie Feinberg has imparted to us about Buffalo Buffalo's queer history. Okay, so we can't end on the asylum. It's too depressing. Uh, so the novel is published in 1993 by Firebrand Books uh, and the offices of Firebrand were located uh, on the second floor of the Home Dairy Building in the Commons at Ithaca, which is the, the pedestrian shopping mall that's located at the center of uh, Ithaca's commercial district. Uh, founded by Nancy K. Barriano in 1984, uh, who was Feinberg's editor for the book. And then uh, Feinberg came back to Buffalo uh, for the book release party for Stonebridge Blues, uh, which was held at the Episcopal Church of the Ascension, uh, which has a dual address, 16 uh, Linwood Avenue and 67 um, North Street. So I will conclude there and I hope people have lots of questions for me. I just realized my microphone wasn't up. Could you share your screen again? Thank you so much, Jeff. That was absolutely- Yeah, yeah. What, do, what do you want me to show? Well, we had one question. We have a couple of questions that we're gonna work through, but certainly while we're answering them, if anyone else in the audience has questions, please type them through now. The question was about uh, which was the actual building for 7D Delaware. Um, uh, oh, okay. In the actual photograph, and then when you have that Sanborn map showing where City Hall is, if you can just show which is City Hall and which was the spot where um, 70 was. Okay, okay, so this this photograph? Yeah, so that one and then the map too. Okay, so if we're going from um, right to left in this photograph, Townsend Hall is in the foreground. Then we see um, there's like a carriage house building behind Townsend Hall. Then we see a gap between the buildings. That's the Guthrie Alley. And let me go back here. Um, okay, so we can see, then there's the Guthrie Alley. And then um, the building behind the alley, right, is 70 Delaware. And I think that's as good as we're gonna get in yeah. terms of a, a photograph of it. Um, because we, uh, I think, you know, Christy and I have been trying for like years now. I, I wrote find... in the chat, you didn't see it yet. I was like, we tried real hard to find a picture yeah. of this gosh darn building. Um, if you yeah. go forward to the next Sanborn map, um, this one? Yeah, so here okay. you can see how Niagara Square is in the middle. Delaware is that street in the middle. So on the left hand side, you can see labeled Buffalo City Hall. Um, and then opposite City uh, Niagara Square from City Hall, you see that US court building. So that's the opposite yes. of the thing. But where we're talking about is like, 
do you have your mouse? Can you wiggle your mouse on the screen so people see the block that we're talking about? Yeah, so there's Delaware Ave. So that Guthrie Alley is right there. So that's where that would have been located. And someone just asked in the chat, is Guthrie, Guthrie Alley still there? And the answer is no, yeah. that entire block was just demolished. And it is now the very large footprint of the Buffalo City Court building. Yeah. Um, so none of those buildings remain. Um, and none of that, the alley structure or anything like that remains. Yeah, um, oh, and I'll add that, that um, I'll add that um, because then Jim Garrow had a lot of legal trouble and the building was slated for demolition. He leaves Buffalo and so um, Mattachine and Buffalo needs a new place to meet and they end up um, securing a space at the Unitarian Universalist Church on Elmwood Avenue. And so that's um, where the organization um, meets for several years before um, they open up a gay community services center. Excellent. And so we have one other question. Um, I think there's a typo in it. It's, it. This question says 1860 or 1861, but I think they mean 1960 or 1961. But the uh, uh, person who wrote this comment said that in 1960 or 1961, they were in a gay bar in Delaware Avenue, but it was on the east side of Delaware. It wasn't a lesbian bar. There were all gay men, and I was the only female in the bar. It was New Year's Eve. Does anyone know where that was? I have no idea of its name. Uh, we happened into it by chance. So I mean, something that I mean, obviously, you have your ideas and thinking, I mean, if you're sure that it was on the east side of Delaware Avenue, and it was closer to City Hall, it could be the underground uh, that's in um, the Trillrain building, or I forget how you say the name of that building. But there was the underground bar. What was the name of underground before it was underground? Um, it oh, the, uh, the Hibachi. Hibachi, thank you. And I was going to say, I we've talked about this before yeah. in a different <laughs> presentation we did. Um, but Hibachi would have been opened in the early 70s. Oh, someone just wrote um, in the chat, just that you, the host, us panelists can see, someone suggested me and my arrow. I don't so think that, I've heard of that was in the same um, building as the Hibachi on Delaware, oh. but um, me and my arrow was after. Oh, but either way, those are on the west side of Delaware. So, you know, it was a long time ago, so we could have our directionals messed up. But those are the two, if it is that closest to downtown, yeah. those are going to be the best ideas. Um, so something so for I, us to I ponder, to and about, certainly yeah. people in the in the audience, if you have more ideas, put them in the chat. Uh, another question that I can definitely answer for you is, uh, will the webinar be archived? Is there a contact info for Jeff in case we give him ideas, um, other factory ideas? Yes, this is going to be archived. So we have been recording this presentation tonight. Um, and so we'll be making that available on our YouTube channel, and then it'll certainly be uh, accessible for the Cornell History uh, Public History Initiative to share as well. Um, and then if Tia, you could put in um, the chat uh, right now, she's putting in the chat the link to that reading guide I had promised you. Jeff painstakingly, wonderfully went through and pulled up uh, a bunch of different sites in the book, even sites that he wasn't able to speak about tonight or have the time to speak about and put his you know idea of what the real life location could be so um that is in there um and then if uh, you go to that you'll be able to get the contact information for us at pbn um you can always contact us and i can connect you with jeff but yeah we would love to hear from you with information like jeff said in the beginning you have oral history scheduled you know all the time. So if, if you feel you have information to add to this, this research, then definitely get in touch with us. Um, another question, have you run across any indication of what altercations or things in South Buffalo were? It seems like it would be industrial. What interrelations? I can't so speak or read today. South Buffalo really isn't represented in, in the novel. And how, I mean, I know the answer to this question, but how has South Buffalo popped up in your just general study of research of LBGTQ history in Western New York? Interestingly, it hasn't popped up <laughs> that that much. Um, and so I don't, I don't know why that is. And so I'm, I'm glad someone is bringing this up because this is something for us to, um, to think about because in terms of, um, people that I've interviewed, stories that they've told, materials that are in the Davis archive. There's not, there's not that much about, about mm -hmm. South Buffalo. 
And then two other things, again, suggestions and ideas of what this unnamed bar could have been. <laughs> Somebody else said stage Pigali, Pig Pigali, I don't know exactly how to spell, uh, say that P-I-G-A-L-L-E. And then someone oh, else suggested okay. if it was up by Allen um, in Allentown, it could have been Crossroads. Oh, I've never heard of Crossroads before. So, so this is a great segue yeah. <laughs> into how, you know, Jeff and PBN, we partnered together and founded the Gay Places Initiative in 2020 to do this documentary work and to, you know, make these connections between the built environment and, and LBGTQ history. We are, it's only been a year and a half, not even no, a year, <laughs> two years, it's almost been two years. Um, so we're still create, you know, getting this information, creating this inventory of sites. So especially everyone who's sharing ideas of, of what different locations are, um, you know, definitely, you know, shoot us an email, reach out to us um, uh, to pass on that information, because we would love to hear that from you. Um, you know, something that Jeff can definitely speak to, and definitely Stephen Veter from Cornell, the Public History Initiative, about how especially when it comes to any sort of marginalized community, that history, no matter what time in the history it's happened, that doesn't get documented the way that white rich people's history <laughs> gets documented. Yeah. Um, so it's not just trying to use what is already written down and get corralling all of that information and, and putting it in a way that we can process and do landmark nominations and put presentations together. But there's just so much history that on purpose wasn't documented. So if you have information about things, definitely uh, would love to hear that from you. Another yeah. question that just popped up, um, does anyone have an update on the filming for the movie? It was meant to be out the summer of 2019 to be shot in Buffalo. I wasn't even oh. aware that there was filming of a movie. I, I could certainly um, talk about this. Um, so th there was a filmmaker, and this is all in the, the Firebrand Books um, records in uh, at Cornell. Um, so shortly after the novel was published, there was a filmmaker um, that bought the rights to the film. Uh, and Leslie Feinberg herself was actually going to write the script. And uh, she didn't like the, the direction that the filmmaker um, was taking. And so dropped out of the project uh, and was incredibly adamant about the fact that then she didn't want a film version to be made. And in um, the 20th anniversary edition um, of the novel um, that you can get for free online from Feinberg's website, um, she specifically says in the introduction to the book that she doesn't want um, any film reproductions, um, that she finds it offensive that uh, someone feels they could tell her story better um, than, than she could tell it. Um, I and I also, I also know from talking to people um, that essentially no one will no one will work on this project because of um, Leslie Feinberg's wishes. So I think even if the filmmaker went ahead and it was made, um, it would kind of be dead in the water. And one of the other reasons that um, Leslie was opposed is that um, she wanted people to be able to see themselves um, in in this book, right? And so, you know, I, I talked about the 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 impact that this this book had on me in terms of recognizing that that there was gay history in Buffalo, um, but that uh, because um, there's not trans people are as diverse as everyone else, right? That's not kind of one. Um, uh, codified experience uh, and that she then if, if Jess Goldberg was played by uh, a certain actor right that that would kind of imprint in people's memory that that's what um, the character looked like and she didn't want that she wanted um, people who were queer or gender nonconforming to be able to see pieces of themselves in Jess Goldberg. I really love that. <laughs> Um, well, that is an awkward situation for that movie, then, if it actually does move forward. Um, a really great new new question. Uh, where did Leslie live as an adult? So we know that she was here in Buffalo through her childhood and, and young adulthood. What happened after that? 
Great question. Um, so like Jess Goldberg, she does go to the New York City area and um, she lives most of her adult life um, in Jersey City um, with her long-term partner, um, Minnie Bruce Pratt. Uh, and Minnie Bruce um, uh, is a professor at Syracuse University. And so um, she would go back and forth between Syracuse and um, their apartment in Jersey City. And then during the last six years um, of Leslie's life, when um, she was suffering from uh, advanced Lyme disease and a lot of other health complications, um, she lived in Syracuse with Minnie Bruce. But like the Jess Goldberg character, right, who goes away and then comes back to Buffalo, um, Leslie would come and go and she was never completely um, out of touch uh, with what was going on in Buffalo and her, and her roots here. Excellent. And then I think what will likely be the last question or comment of the night. Oh, somebody did mention that um, that they believed that the Italianate brick building just uh, north of the Sattler on the east side of Delaware was a gay bar. So that would be oh. if I'm thinking this correctly in my brain, that would be that building that's kind of all by itself, um, just below Chippewa, I think, or two blocks below Chippewa. And it's the, um, it currently has the office of donuts and coffee in front of it. It has like this pop-up coffee and donut place that sometimes operates oh. in this little vestibule that they pop in the front of it. Um, I know that that building was being considered for local landmark status. I don't know whatever happened with that application. So that's definitely something to keep in the back of my head. Uh, when, uh, uh, if that comes up again, uh, one comment that doesn't really have an answer, but I know that Jeff will enjoy to know that somebody wrote this down is that somebody commented, I don't know if we've looked into it, but that they would love to know the similar information with Ani DeFranco about the documentary in mapping of their songs and, and, and music and stuff. And I just say that because I know that Jeff very much enjoys Ani DeFranco. <laughs> Oh, I'm a, I am a huge Ani DeFranco fan. Oh, so that that can be a future Gay Places project. Right. And this will be officially the last question. So thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, and it's actually from one of our, our co-hosts, from Stephen. And so the question is, um, curious to know how tracking down all of these sites and seeing how many of them were demolished changed how you see Buffalo's history uh, more largely. That's a that's a great um question because it really speaks to what do we as preservationists um, do with sites that have been demolished in terms of um, retrospectively documenting right and commemorating the history that that happened there and, and what can we find um, and it, it also shows why um, preservationists need to be proactive in terms of right um, designating and, and registering um, buildings, right, to save them before they they are under threat. Um, so that, right, if we want to document queer places um, in Buffalo, that we actually have um, parts of the built environment that that we can show people, um, and not just just photographs of parking lots where where places once. Uh, once stood. And that is so fundamental um, because the thing that, that um, I would argue about preservation is that it always has to happen in the context of other forms of public history, because it's not enough to document the site and preserve the site. We have to create education and interpretation um, around those sites, right, to, to use the built environment to engage the community uh, in something like LGBTQ history uh, and to also engage the community in future um, preservation planning um, work. And, and I do also want to, to note, just in conclusion, um, that the goal here uh, in terms of this project, and thank you, Dr. Veter, for making the suggestion, um, is creating a, a digital history exhibit where there's going to be something like a map um, of the sites in Stonebridge Blues. 
and that you can go to that digital exhibit and click on the sites in the map and read about the sites and see photographs and other um, materials that are connected to them. So that's kind of the ultimate goal um, here that I'm, that I'm working towards with, with this, this information that I have collected. Excellent. Well, with that, this has been a great evening. There's been so, I mean, I can't wait for Jeff to see the chat after this is all done <laughs> and see all the amazing comments that everyone's been putting. Um, thank you so much for everyone attending. Thank you for Stephen Veter for co-sponsoring tonight with us. Um, as I said uh, before, we, we, we did record the program tonight, so we're going to be having that up on our YouTube. Uh, we did share the reading guide um, in the chat box, but I'm sure that we'll probably be sending a follow-up email to everybody, thanking everyone for attending and the links to the different things as well. Um, so with that, we will close out this thing. Thank you so very much for everyone for participating um, and have a great rest of your evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>